Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr. Thank you so much for listening. Today, we are talking with an incredible label called Young Heavy Souls. They're out of Detroit, and I'm speaking with Matthew, the founder of this label. You can find out more from this label at uh, youngheavysouls.com. And they're also on Bandcamp. They just came up with some new records. They've got a, a, a busy year ahead. And, um, th- you can find them on Bandcamp at youngheavysouls.bandcamp.com. This was such a fun chat. You know, we talk a lot about vinyl. They have tons of vinyl and some cool variants and everything. And so we camp out on the subject of vinyl a lot on this episode, specifically because Matthew used to work at a pressing plant. And so we talk about his job there and the things that he learned there. And there's some really great advice in here. If you and your label um, press vinyl or you're thinking about taking that step to press vinyl. So we talk a lot about that subject. And we talk about the origins of, of his label. Speaking of origins, if you or somebody you love is thinking about starting a record label um, or are currently running a record label, I want to make sure that you grab um, one of our free resources. Two in particular is, one is how to start a record label checklist, uh, just a handful of things to look over before you start your record label or while you're starting your record label. And the second is a free guide, which brings together a lot of the advice that you hear on this show um, into one PDF. And both of those are free. You can get those at otherrecordlabels.com. Thanks for listening. So I don't know too much about Detroit's music scene, I guess, like aside from Motown, and I think techno started there. I don't know if that's true. I yeah. Think, yeah. And like, I also, what's weird is like, I also kind of associate it with Jack White because, you know, because of its blue collar nature. Like, is there like a specific genre or culture, or, or, or can that not really be nailed down? <laughs> I think there's, I mean, there's so much with Detroit's music uh, history. I mean, it's like the richest tapestry yeah. of right. music history, but besides Motown, uh, yeah, techno, then you've got, um, like one of the, it's like one of the hip hop meccas of the world. Like Jay Dilla came from Detroit, like Slum Village, Eminem. Right. Uh, then you got like, you know, Big Sean. I mean, there's, Hip hop is so both like underground and mainstream hip hop is really big in Detroit. Um, then yeah, of course Jack White, the White Stripes, Third Man Records, uh, like, and they're doing so much to bring, you know, more of the music industry to Detroit. Like, because um, right, they have a pressing I, plant, yeah. right? Yeah. So I actually used to work at that pressing plant for oh, no a year. Yeah. Um, so, and that was a really insightful thing for me when I'm like, you know, working on my label and then going into being in this like, oh, you I know, bet. huge facility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was really inspiring to be yeah. there. Yeah. I, I mean, what kind of things could you learn from there or, or did you take home from that? Well, a lot of information about how vinyl records are pressed mm-hmm. and made and the, you know, they were, my job was essentially to listen to records that were coming off of the press and check them for quality, like to make sure that they are, uh, you know, there's not like big skips or pops or, you know, anything that's sure. actually in the, in, in every record, like that's going to happen on one offs and stuff. But Wait a second. Sure Wait, are you all- telling, are you saying, are you the people that like listen on headphones? Yeah, yeah, oh, that's what I did. That's a brutal job. Is that? <laughs> did you like that? Uh, I think I was uniquely suited for it. Okay. Um, I always uh, like. I always like listening. Like ever since, like as far as back as I can remember, I always have had headphones in. Yeah. Um, of course, I would listen to different songs all the time, and like <laughs> that was my way of exploring music. But then there. I think the first project that I worked on was like an Aki Thump reissue. And that's like, was one of my like favorite albums in high school, oh. and, you know, one that I've always loved. And then I was like, when I got there, I got the job. I was super excited. <laughs> you know, then I had to hear that album like a million times, yeah. but I, it, but honestly, I literally just put it on, um, like a few days ago and I was super into it still. I mean, it's a great album. So I'm not, it wasn't, 
it's just a testament. That was one thing it taught me was, all right, can you make a, an album that's so good that people could listen to it <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> theoretically yeah. like 800 times and still, you know, groove out to it. I mean, yeah, there's parts at, in times of the day where, you know, I would get a little exhausted, but yeah. I, there, I don't know. It's weird. You get into kind of a Zen state. I'm not listening to the music after a certain point just for the, like cracks and pops in the record. So, but right. not, there's only a few of us that did it and people, um, you know, would had tried it that were doing other jobs there and just weren't, couldn't really keep up with it. Sure. It, it was tedious for sure. Well, I did a, a tour of a pressing plant here in Canada, um, a couple years ago and I went into the room where there was two people sitting there with headphones listening to like all of side A and side B and, like I was just astounded because of just the thought of like I don't know listening to some like metal record at like eight thirty in the morning on a Monday morning. I mean, some people would love that, but for me, that would be pretty tough. <laughs> or any music really that was that was challenging to listen to. I, I just found that job to be so such a really interesting job. Yeah, it was. It, I mean there were records like so what was good like i guess it would only get really difficult on times where there was maybe a really big order and so there was that was the only thing that they were pressing for the most part um but if there was a time where there was like five different things that they were pressing uh that you could theoretically listen to an album like twice in a day and, you know as we're kind of rotating and i would hear different records so okay. it wasn't it wasn't always like and then there was times too where there was records that there was three of us doing it at the time and there was one that i just wasn't really like trying to hear again and again and again and the other guys really liked it so i'm like i'll take I'll take this run and you guys just listen to oh, that one. Nice. I really am sick of that record. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's nice. But uh, yeah. Well, so, you know, but overall it was, it was like, a, it was a crazy experience and really cool to like learn that much about vinyl records. Were they doing um, like, were they open to the public when they first got started? Like could an indie label press records there? Yeah. Um, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. Like smaller artists definitely could do it. Like indie labels could. Um, I feel like I, I wasn't on that side of things, but I do remember listening to like some Detroit artists that I knew, and yeah. they had their records were being pressed there, or people like I knew in the different scenes, or like smaller artists that I had heard of were getting their records pressed there. Um, I think that uh, they wanted to make sure that Detroit artists could always like have their music pressed there, but I wasn't sure about artists like independent artists, you know, from other cities. Sure. I, I, I guess that would have, uh, or, or tell me, did that give you confidence to press vinyl with your label? Because it's a, it's a pretty daunting, it's expensive and it's, it's pretty intimidating for a lot of small labels. Yeah, no, it really did. Like, because um, we had done, we did one vinyl in like, 2014 and I had kind of no idea how to do it um, we just did not plan properly for the timeline I wasn't aware that it could take up to you know, 12 weeks or longer to yeah. when, from when you give them all the assets um, so they ended like you know, we went through uh, Pirate Press and they, they were actually really accommodating and helped us kind of hit our deadline but it was just, we didn't know how to do it at all. So it really turned me off to the process for a while. And right. then uh, I did two more as I, in like 2016, I started doing it again through the label. And by that time I had become a vinyl enthusiast on my, in my free time. Mm -hmm. So I was listening to a lot more records and getting more into the culture. And I was on Discogs all the time. Uh, I started, I was like selling records on Discogs, so I kind of got used to grading them. Even though I I would usually stick with CDs and tapes because grading records is like at the time I didn't know how to tell if it was in good condition or not. Sure. And then 
but I used all of that um, kind of in my application to third man. And then after working there for a year, I just, I, yeah, after that, I know what to look for. I know common problems. I know that if a record skips, it might not be a problem with all of them. It could be the turntable that someone's listening to because we have like really bass heavy music. Right. So if someone's listening on like a lower quality turntable, it might skip, it might knock, um, if you have the tone arm not adjusted right or whatever, and also learning that we shouldn't try to cram a whole bunch of bass heavy music yeah. to one disc of vinyl and just so, like all that kind of the nuances. So you learned about the mastering side of things too, like the audio, you know, then like you learned a lot about that. Cause we just had a record, um, the uh, test pressing and, and we were kind of stupid to, to, to push the the length of, of tracks on both sides and and we even we had a pretty bass heavy song um, at the end of of uh, side B and it was it just didn't turn out too great towards the end of the record so you must have learned the audio side of things as well yeah I that was um, that's something that uh, I'm not as huge of a stickler on, I mean, if it's going to be, if, if you're pushing, you know, 24 minutes on one side, yeah, it's going to, it's not going to sound good. Um, but usually, uh, so we work with a pressing, another pressing plant here in Detroit to do, you know, 90% of all of our records. And, uh, you know, he, it's been, if there's something that sounds wrong with the test pressing, we can have a kind of a good dialogue with, uh, who they go through for the cutting process to say, all right, you should, you know, you're cramming a lot of, you know, electronic music onto this, this vinyl, you should try to spread it out or yeah. cut some tracks or whatever. So I like, from what I really learned about was grading the quality of an already pressed record, not so much mm. the mastering process, sure. except for what we all like discussed at work. Right. No, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's a like I I've done vinyl a few times, um, but I still made you know quite a bit mistakes this go around, and I I you know it's it's hard also to kind of temper the artist's expectations. You know, we printed on digital, so the CMYK wasn't as vibrant as the on screen digital version of the album cover, and there was just a few things that the artist was a little bit disappointed in. And I mean, I think they have such high expectations because it's a couple thousand dollars of an investment and it's, you know, for some people it's their first time ever being pressed on vinyl. So there's just so much to yeah. think about in that process. Yeah. It's, it's, it can be uh, really involved and I feel, you know, I've been, I've been really keeping an eye on when I buy a new record or been kind of following a new pressing of something and the packaging, all the like kind of bells and whistles. I mean, I, I saw a lot of that at Third Man, but then I also have been paying attention to just when I'm buying records. And there's like all those little touches, like you said, you can, when you do the cover, um, you can do, you know, like certain parts of the cover are a different texture or, mm -hmm. or kind of embossed or sure. you can, uh, the inner sleeves, if it's just a white paper inner sleeve, that's kind of, it gives a, it's, it's serviceable, but it feels a little bit cheaper True. as opposed to a fully printed sleeve. Um, but it's funny, like I'll see a, a, a single LP that comes in a, in a gatefold because some major label pressed it. And I'm like, well, it would be nice to have that kind of yeah. <laughs> you know, leeway to just, to just stick one record in a gatefold <laughs> That's and true. double our cost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's made people a lot more picky with like, well, or I should say vinyl collector is a lot more picky with, with uh, purchasing vinyl. I know for me, like, um, some you know when I buy a major label record, which I rarely do, but if I if I'm buying a major release and then like you said, it comes in a paper sleeve, it's black vinyl. Even the vinyl doesn't feel as heavy. That's mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. such a disappointment. Yeah, it's 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 weird. I get that like kind of, or if I get one from a label that I even support or whatever, and it's not some crazy extravaganza of an experience i feel you know just a little bit uh shorted yeah. even, even though 
it's not that huge of a deal. I understand <laughs> that you don't want to have to up your cost so much for every little bell and whistle. Yeah. I remember when vinyl was kind of coming back and there was all this talk from from the old old timers and they were talking about like the warmth of the sound and it was all about how it was higher fidelity, which is which there is some truth to. And but I, I wonder if that's kind of doesn't seem to be the the angle that interests most of uh, the vinyl collectors today, or, or at least the indie music do, um, fans. Do you do you know what it is about vinyl that your listeners like, or, or what is it, it that you like about it? Well, for me personally, I had always kind of had um, records when I was younger. My dad had given me a lot of his when I was really starting to get into music, and I always had a turntable because i was making like hip-hop beats and just trying to learn how to sample but for a long time i had this collection of you know hand-me-downs and uh, salvation army records and um dollar bin records and all that Mm -hmm. so i remember going to somebody's house like a friend of a friend and they had this big wall of records or like this huge stack and I was looking at him like, this is a good album. This is a good album. I didn't know you could just actually have good music on vinyl. At that time, I just had, you know, I'm like 19 and all of my records are just beat up hand-me-downs or ones I got, you know, for 25 cents a piece. Mm. So that kind of sparked my interest. And I was like, well, I love this album. I feel like I should, you know, sort of show my support of this album by having it on vinyl uh and seeing artwork that i really dig and having that larger the tactile experience of it sure. the, the ritual of it i mean i think that's what a lot of i would say casual people are into is like the ritual of it um music enthusiasts that are just that are not aren't audiophiles right uh and if you kind of slip down that rabbit hole i think it's you know because i've felt like that with other hobbies and stuff where it's like the, I can all, everything could always be a little bit better. I want to have the craziest, you know, listening experience. So the turntable has to be of a certain caliber. The needle has to be of a certain caliber, the system, the uh, way the room is treated, the record pressing absolutely has to be, sure. like, have these qualifications. But I think the casual listener just wants to maybe, um, listen to music that they like in a more engaged and intentional way. Mm. Well, yeah. And I, mean, I think that's where our fans are. I agree. I agree. I've always thought it's, it's this response to digital and, and digital is so great, but it digital has just made music, you know, such a smaller and smaller thing. I mean, it really is microscopic now on our phones. And mm. so I feel for me, I just need that reminder of what this is that i need that visual reminder that i love this record and i love 12 inches by 12 inches of this record (laughs) yeah 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 i mean though it's it's a it's a fun thing to like when i have like a favorite a few favorite groups where it's just all right if i can i want to get every single i want to get every album and it's just kind of a no-brainer sort of a thing and yeah and then it's it's just fun. It's like collecting is just kind of a fun thing to do. Let me go back to Detroit. It um is the image of Detroit something that you've adopted with your label, uh, you know, with the image of your label is that is that uh part of your aesthetic or your voice? Well, when we like so I started the label when I was in college in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is on the west side of the state. Okay. Um, Detroit and Metro Detroit, where I grew up, is in, on the east side of the state. Uh, so it was weird because I went off to college, started the label, like, and then moved um, to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is also on the west side of the state, and kind of like developed what I was trying to do over there. Then I brought it to Detroit because we were coming out for shows and artists, and we had artists in the city and artists we were working with. And then it was just like a bigger, better music scene. Mm. So when I moved out here in 2013, um, there was this kind of, you know, perception of a lot of people moving to Detroit because it was hip. So, you know, even, even though I'm like from down the street, like moving into the city city, I wanted to always be, 
just like respectful and make sure that I'm not just kind of trying to stomp in, come and like say right. we're super Detroit. We're, <laughs> you know, raised and born here in, yeah. in Detroit because it's just like, can be really tacky because a lot of, a lot of people were doing that at the time. And then, you know, we, people weren't sure if it was just going to be a fleeting thing and everyone was going to leave. So we definitely say that. I mean, we operate out of Detroit and we have a lot of artists from the city. Um, and so it's definitely part of like, we, we say we're um, operated out of Detroit cause we are. And then we just kind of let the music speak. I mean, yeah. hip hop and electronic music is very Detroit by nature. I believe. Are you Detroit exclusive or Michigan exclusive with your artists? No, we have artists from all over. Like at the beginning it was mostly, uh, Kalamazoo artists, but a lot of those artists who are kind of transplants because it was like a college town from all over Michigan. And then we had a few artists in Chicago and there's like this kind of, you know, unspoken bond between the Chicago music scene and the Detroit music scene. Cause they're pretty close mm. and have like kind of a similar Midwest thing going on. So we had artists from, we have artists that now have kind of like dispersed, you know, some of them that were in Michigan are now out in California. And we, last year we signed this art, this group from Vancouver, uh, Palm Haze. Oh, nice. That's, um, yeah, they're, um, like kind of a shoegaze trip hop duo that's originally from Brazil and then moved to, uh, Vancouver. And so that was our first like international yeah. artist. <laughs> um, but yeah, with the internet, I mean, it's like there's no reason to limit yourself unless you really want to have that like homegrown local vibe. There's really no reason to limit. Yeah, to that's just. right. Yeah. It's hardly an international. Well, I mean, Vancouver is like the farthest <laughs> Canadian city from you, even though you're like five minutes from Canada. <laughs> right. It was really it was really <laughs> funny because then they um, like we were promoting their album last year and then they ended up playing uh in windsor which is oh nice from detroit is literally a five minute drive yeah you know, that's right bridge and so that was that was pretty cool but. yeah i live i mean i live about two hours from windsor and i i don't cross in windsor as much as i do in buffalo but um i've been there many times and to sarnia as well cool yeah yeah i mean i i haven't been up there enough but we went to vancouver to really like film a video for them. And it was, it was really cool. I really like it. That's I mean, cool. It's kind of like a West coast thing. And then, sure. You know, yeah. Uh, so tell me about the origins of your label. Like, how, like how far back does this go? Um, so I guess technically I registered the company at the end of 2010. Oh my gosh. Um, 10 years. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like, and it's, it's like, you know, sometimes it kind of, it felt like it existed as a name only for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know exactly what you mean. It, it was a legal entity and, uh, uh, and something we were wrapping hard and like, you know, it started off more like a crew. And then as I started to get a little bit older and more serious about how I wanted to, what the vision could actually be, it sort of really started to form into a label, I would say, um, like 2013 or 2014, but it, I've been doing this thing for a while. It started when, you know, I was making hip hop music personally. I had friends in Kalamazoo that were doing hip hop and electronic beat production. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for beats. Um, and then I was, and I was making beats as well out of like necessity, but we we're looking for beats and I'm like, this song I really like, and I would, I would listen to it without any vocals. And, um, maybe, you know, we should just put out some of your stuff. Like I guess I was saying to like friends, like, we should just put out this music, um, as is, like, mm -hmm. we can just do that. And, uh, I'll put out something and then you can make some beats for me. And then you just put out your thing and I'll like help promote it and, and whatever. And, and then it would just kind of organically grew from there. And then he's, and then artists were bringing me their friends and we were like kind of playing shows and I was meeting people and we just kind of clicked and just brought more people into the crew. And then eventually when I'm looking at two years later, we had, you know, 10 people that I was actively trying to promote and 
help like speak to your art for them and do videos. And I was like, I was really hands on early on. I wasn't doing everything by any means, but I was, I really wanted to take that, um, like RZA approach to it with like how RZA was very involved with Wu-Tang Clan producing all of their stuff and, or like LP or something, Mm -hmm. um, with Def Jocks Mm -hmm. being super hands on with all the releases. And I felt myself a Renaissance man at the time, but quickly realized, I mean, these guys could, could do plenty of it on their own and I didn't need to be as involved. And yeah. Yeah. You know, is there a part of the process that you enjoy more than others? Um, I like the planning phase. I really like when I find something or somebody sends me some new music and I'm like really into it and we're talking about ideas and then, you know, it gets, it gets a little bit tiring and then the artwork comes in and the artwork's yeah. really exciting. And then we kind of get a second win and then, um, you know, I'm listening in my car and I'm like, this is, I'm really excited to be attached to this. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. You know, so that's, that's probably my favorite part. And then I get really anxious and nervous on like release day or <laughs> leading up to a release. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I used to enjoy the release shows, even though I would get super nervous before release shows, if they were going to like be really good turnouts or be kind of, you know, not great turnouts. Um, or if a video we're about to put out, if people so you, are gonna like, you take all that personally, even though it's not your music per se. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's why <laughs> that's I, yeah, and that's why I started, I believe, to lean even more into the label like role because I would because if I'm taking it that personally for other people's music, you know, with my own, I'm, <laughs> I'm way more sensitive. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. I, I've had, um, you know, when when press will uh, decline coverage of a record that's not my own. It's an artist I'm working with or whatever. I just I get so depressed. I take it so personally. And and even when they critique the singing or the production, and if I had no part in it, I still it still hurts. <laughs> Right. No, for sure. And it's because I, I kind of analyzed that feeling before and it's like you there. So yeah, you're not critiquing my, for my musical talent, but you are critiquing my taste. True. And true. My, my yeah. labels taste to, to a degree. Um, or, and if they critique the production or like you said, like whatever specific aspect of the music, it sort of reflects like, you take it like, oh, you think I don't care that much about the product attached to my company's name or whatever. And even though it's something like you like actually enjoyed or didn't have an issue with, then it just it just creates a little bit of doubt. You know? Yeah, yeah. How many people do you have working with you? Are you are still a Renaissance man? Are you still on your own, or how does it all work? Well, I have people that I work with really regularly on a lot of different parts of the. Sure. Um, like process and I'm kind of working to get a few people consistently um, that will be working with me in 2021, like for like everyday kind of things. Cause usually I have, I've had a lot of people come in for like six months and, and work with me and then uh, something else comes along or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then like the artists too, they have usually, kind of their like little teams. So somebody might this somebody might just bring me all of the finished stuff and then it's really me. Oh that's nice. Connecting with like yeah, I mean with with producers and electronic artists, you know, that can that can happen sometimes. Mm. Um where they know they know who they want to have master it. They have an idea for the artwork and they yeah. have an idea for this or whatever. And do you like that? Yeah, I do. I I also do miss being like heavily involved with some releases and yeah. feeling like, yeah, I didn't, you know, my name's not on this on the on the cover or anything, but I was like, you know, I really this was my main creative <laughs> focus for a long time was sure. your project. Um I do miss that. You know, occasionally I do get to still be really hands-on on a project, but um then I think I also get a better, more objective view of the music when somebody just gives me all the assets. Um, That's true. And yeah, they, I felt that way too. Listen, right, and you're like, I'm a listener. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, you know, 
So yeah, I to- yeah, I totally. Uh, I feel like I can get, I get s- less likely to get sick of the record, and I, I feel like a little bit more motivated during the promotional stage if I didn't have to help out with the mixes or critique something or whatever. Um, if I got it and it was just still fresh to me by the time we were promoting it. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're just, you know, you can just see it a little bit clearer. Yeah, so close to it. You you brought up the planning stage, and 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 I like that you like that. I, I enjoy that as well, um, much more than the implement implementing stage. <laughs> but but <laughs> right. uh, but uh, I'm curious, like, what does your lead time look like? Like, what kind of um, how much how much uh, space do you give yourself from when you get the masters to to release date that's always a a huge question for a lot of our community and i'm curious how you work ideally two to three months um longer if we're going to do some sort of physical uh version of it Mm. um like at least with vinyl i mean with cds and tapes it, it can be a little bit shorter but with vinyl but like if you want your record to come out on the day of the digital release, then we need to leave like 10 weeks at least. Um, so, right. The, yeah. So that's, yeah, like two to three months is really like the lead time. And I, I used to be really bad at that. I used to be like putting out, I remember um, getting masters like night before, and putting it out on Bandcamp like the next day from releases back in the day and how stressful that was and how stressed I yeah. felt about it because yeah. we had been promoting an album that wasn't done for some reason. I know, and, uh, I've been there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm just, I'm glad if after all this time I've learned that, like don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's hard for artists to understand that though. I mean, they still want to be spontaneous and, they they might call you or email you and say I I'm working on a track right now. Can we have it out in the next couple of weeks? Do you experience that? Yeah, yeah, and I think I've I've gotten to the point where they understand if I'm like no, I can't really do that like, because there's other things that are in the pipeline or other things True. that we've been trying to balance and um, to put it out and kind of shortchange another release or to not give it the proper focus isn't going to help really anyone. And yeah. if you want to really, it's, if it's hard when it's something that I do really want to put out, but I just don't have the, and, and they want to get it out, but it doesn't quite line up. Um, usually I'll just be like, you should put it out and we'll share it and we'll help promote True. it and stuff. But like, I can't really take on more than I can chew at this moment. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's smart, and it's so hard to do that. I, I feel like I'm the same as you. I mean, I've been my label became legitimate in 2010 as well, and and uh, oh, I yeah. I feel like I'm that at that stage finally, like in the past year, where I can just say, listen, I I have to say no as much as I want. It, when I was mm-hmm. younger and and dumber, I, I would say, okay, let's do it, let's do it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it is hard to say no. Yeah, it's it's definitely something you gotta like. I feel like a mistake that you learn from over time. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. What's the meaning behind the name Young Heavy Souls? Um, you know, there was I, I just like thought it sounded good. Honestly, yeah. I, over the years, <laughs> I've I, over the years people have asked me and if I've tried to put some like grandiose <laughs> name or some meaning <laughs> to it, and like, oh, it's like this and that. But really, yeah. it's just, I thought it sounded cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I was talking with someone recently. I can't remember now, but like that's the second. I mean, that's I've heard that quite a lot, and I think that's totally <laughs> legitimate. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like uh, it's, if if something feels good saying, then like it's you know that's what more reason to really need. Yeah. <laughs> I was going through your Instagram and 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 some of your uh, stuff online, and and I came across uh, a post, um, you know, back in in June about Black Lives Matter, and I want to ask you about something that you kind of made reference to, and and uh, something I've heard only recently from from other folks, and and I, I find it very intriguing. But there's a lot of music 
that has roots in black artists and in black history, which is what you made reference to in this post. And I'm curious about that. And I'm curious how labels and, and non-black artists can acknowledge that reality. I mean, it's just something I've never really thought about uh, myself. Yeah, well, you know, rock and roll is kind of the, and jazz um, and blues mm. are like the kind of foundations for so much of today's modern music. Um, and you can really trace that through, uh, you know, hip hop and, and then, you know, obviously mm. hip hop and electronic music. Like you can really find at the root, if you just keep digging, you'll find a black artist that kind of did something radical and everyone or a culture of black artists that did something radical and people, you know, taking it, putting their own spin on it, it evolves, it becomes something else. And that's, you know, totally cool. It's just, if you're going to, especially, especially in hip hop music and, and all that and, and rock music um, where, especially in rock music where black artists could, you know, where they had labels had to put white artists doing black yeah. music because it wouldn't right. sell otherwise. Right. That's um, so true. And so it's, it's like, if you can, are you going to, if you're going to like drink from this well of, of kind of like mm. black culture, you should. And then there's this, you know, all this um, racial unrest happening to kind of turn a blind eye to it while sure. then you make money off of, you know, the, the things that black people created the foundation for isn't really right um mm. so it's just important i think i think you know non-black artists can acknowledge that the, the black forefathers of a lot of really important musical movements and so I'm, I'm looking at it from an american music standpoint sure. yeah um, you know from like american music like it's it's really it's just kind of mind-boggling how many um how many people ignore that those roots or the how those things can evolve? Because yeah, you you see modern iterations of certain types of music, um, and you can even find black dances, black fashion in the fabric of music from all like all over the world. You know? Yeah, right. It's so interesting, and I mean, it it is something, and, it, and you don't even have to go back that far too. I remember reading. Um, the biography of Sam Phillips from Sun Records in Memphis, and and mm -hmm. he grew up in the cotton fields, and so he had he had heard the music of African African Americans and rhythm and blues, and and then as he got into radio and and his record label, he was championing that music that because it had this like passion and soul that at the time he didn't hear in like hillbilly music or 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 gospel music, and. At the time of reading this book, I remember thinking, wow, that was so progressive of him. But now I kind of <laughs> wonder, like, when does appreciation become appropriation? You know what I mean? Like, how do you honor something without stealing it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, is, I think paying paying homage to who, where you got it from, mm -hmm. or, you know, at least acknowledging it. And I remember there was a lot of, like, talk a few years ago about you know when something would happen where some uh, you know somebody would get murdered by the police which is like there's so many that it's like you can't even really uh you can't really like remember actually all of <laughs> sure. them because it just happens like it sure. literally happens like every day yeah um and then white rappers weren't talking about it much and it's like okay you as, i think that was really where people started to get a little bit upset because like white rappers are it's the most direct correlation with like a current black right. art form and if you're not going to speak on if you're gonna, like all right you're welcome in in, in hip-hop but if you are not like being a true ally mm. to Oh, the founders yeah. and, and everything that's then a good like, word then then what are you doing yeah you know? so yeah it's just you know i'm 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 not gonna like prescribe what everybody should do in every situation sure. it's just how how i feel yeah and being you know like i said w like it's something that i feel like i gotta speak up on being you know a black artist myself and running a label um that is founded on like black music yeah kind of important to speak up yeah, I mean, it's it just such an interesting concept that I had, I just had never thought of, and and I, you know, just 
it was really, um, yeah, it just really hit me um, and makes me want to kind of, you know, trace back a lot of things too and kind of discover the the history of, of things that, what inspired the people that inspired me and, you know, and, and before that too and, and, and to honor that. Let, let me ask you. Yeah, about, yeah. Let me ask you about. I, I asked you about the the parts of running a label you enjoy. I want to ask you about the parts, the hardest parts. I mean, is there stuff that you struggle with, or that um, you know gives you the most grief? Um, I guess I'm not great at, at giving criticism. I know that's one thing <laughs> that I've been trying to like, and it's and not to say that it's like that. There's a lot to, to criticize <laughs> right. with, with artists and stuff, but occasionally if i'm not feeling the direction of something or i just you know i, I want to be better at, at like being direct um mm. about it and so that's something that i kind of struggle with it doesn't come up all the time but it, it does come up sometimes and i'm not great with that yeah. uh and then i don't like the i don't like promoting i don't like social media that much personally <laughs> yeah um it's just you know i yeah. know it's kind of like it's I necessary know. but I, know. I wish we could just i could just my job could be finding cool artists putting helping them put together their projects as far as like you know the art the packaging the the records um and then put it out and they get paid and the label gets paid and sure everyone's happy that would be awesome <laughs> yeah, you know <laughs> I agree. yeah I'm with you. do you ever work with a publicist or do you have to handle stuff in in-house mostly um well, yeah we work with publicists sometimes not on every single release just because yeah. it's really expensive sometimes yeah. but uh we we do work with um a couple different pr companies when there's something that like you know full album we're do we're if we're really trying to push something super hard you know yeah yeah. No, yeah, I, 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 I've been the same way before. And, and you know, there's been times where it's been experimental electronic or instrumental or something and just does not make sense. You know, even a, pub, I, even a publicist would tell me, like, I can't really pitch this record. And um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, you, I guess you just got to make that judgment call. Yeah, yeah. Like anything with, with some crossover appeal, or sure. an artist that already kind of has some buzz or has a name for themselves like that makes sense to me um but you know and i always think in my head and i wish i had you know ten thousand dollars for every release like if we could <laughs> yeah. put ten thousand into every release i think we could do some serious damage with like yeah. pr vinyl um oh, yeah. like a video you know yeah it, I would say shows now, but because of like, you know, yeah. the way things are now, <laughs> that would have been in the equation though. Yeah. Shows, you know? Right. Right. No, that's true. Have you been able to, the times you have done PR or even the times that you've done like more elaborate pressings, have you been able to measure your ROI and say, okay, that was worth it. And, and I feel good about having spent the money on, on such and such. Yeah, it's 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 a little difficult to quantify occasionally. There's only a couple times where it's been like one to one where their placement directly like what they right. placed yeah. us directly got us income. You know, it's yeah. really hard to find that. Um because then there's be there will be campaigns where uh, you know, a few months later after the campaign is over an opportunity has came because they saw a press piece it's on so this true. artist or because, yeah. you know, so it's like, well, I mean, that brought in income later, uh, kind of in a roundabout way, which is good, which is, you know, awesome. Um, but, you know, getting placed on like the band camp, uh, new and notable, that was like one where you can see a lot of people then are buying, the album yeah. uh, because it's on the front page of Bandcamp or whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I know what you mean. And also I, I try to remember too that's like, you know, we there may be something really cool that came like indirectly from something that a publicist did. And it's just you you never know. Or like you maybe did the publicist did three things and then you did one thing, but your one thing was what tipped over, you know like was the straw that broke the camel's back. So it, it, you're right. It is so hard to, to quantify. 
Yeah, or if there's a good look on a, on like a bigger blog, and it's just that one big placement, and then you can just and then you post it socially, and it gets a lot of engagement socially across um, you know the labels platforms, the artist platform. Then, and that is what the the benefit was was this post that maybe the the blog post itself didn't generate a lot of plays even, but the look of being on the blog like that nobody even like clicked on yeah. is, gets us more plays, which is, it's just, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think blogs are, are not really where it's at now. It's definitely like playlists and stuff. Sure. And I'm sure people that are a little bit more forward thinking or have their finger on the pulse more are going to say it's like this other thing, or <laughs> new, whatever, but you know. Yeah. Well, actually it's funny you mentioned that about how like, you know, you might getting on a great blog, may not turn into sales but it is like a image thing I, I was talking to an artist recently about the same thing for vinyl like like when you have those like really cool product shots of your vinyl in hand and you post those to instagram that may convince someone to go listen to you on spotify but not to actually buy the vinyl and so it, <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean it's just weird no that's that's definitely true um and I like for me, it's I'm really liking now that we're trying to get vinyl out for more of our releases and not um, mm. and kind of trying to build that uh, that like reputation as a label that does a lot of vinyl. And for me, honestly, just seeing our web store and seeing that there's like, you know, I think we're going to be on our 24th pressing uh, oh, wow. come the next one. Uh, when we did when we did number one in 2014 and number two in 2016, and so oh yeah, um, seriously, it's, yeah. So like that for me is, is satisfying within itself, and I think that people you know will are starting to come around to like oh this label does does a lot of records we should you know, check that out the vinyl yeah well you know it's funny you talk about the store because it's like. You know, I've been in a position where I've been kind of convinced to place an order on a tape or a vinyl from a record label if there's other records or tapes or a t shirt or, you know, a hoodie or something that I can throw in and kind of make it worth the whole shipping thing. So I, I think you're kind of, you're right. You're onto something that it's like if you're a label and you have, in your merch store, physical merch store, you have one record, two records, or one tape and one record. Um, I feel like you might get more orders just when someone looks at you and thinks, wow, I'm going to browse here and and make a substantial order to make it worth it. Yeah. Um, we we were doing some like discount codes in the summer and, and like the spring and stuff. And um, we posting them on Reddit and, and things and, like, cause we have a few reissues that we've been doing, which is something I've been kind of into the past few years oh, is nice. like doing vinyl reissues. Um, and so we have a few that I know people like that don't necessarily know our label are fans of, and we are trying to basically get, you know, have leverage that so that people all right, I definitely want to get this one and this one because these are the ones that I've heard of outside of this label, but let me see what else is on here. And this, hopefully something similar which usually it is right yeah you know we have because there's just you know um and it's funny too when you say you want to make the cart worth it because i i know that um like polyvinyl was doing some i think it was like buy two get one free yeah and there was two that i really wanted and then i didn't know like i wasn't as familiar with the rest of their catalog so i'm like listening on spotify to find <laughs> something that i want you know, yeah. and I spent way more time on it than, <laughs> than like, you know, but sure. it worked, you know, they're getting, they're, that's probably a great, that's something I should try. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, but you need a lot of records to do that because I mean, I think we have like on my store, I think we have two or three records. So to do buy two, get three, buy two, get one free, you'd be buying all the vinyl we have. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's not bad. that's not bad though get not the bad. Yeah. i'll get the vinyl discography <laughs> yeah that's true uh, i i uh i don't want to take too much of your time but i was thinking i was talking to someone uh talking with someone today and and i wanted to get your opinion about picking a release date we're kind of going back to the the planning of of albums does it matter to you do you have any rules or or strategies with picking a release date um, we, I mean, we try to obviously keep it on Fridays, uh, but I feel I just over like trial and error. We, I try not to put out too much in the summer. Yeah. Like I feel like at least, in, I mean, this summer has been differently, but in the past summers have been really hard to like break through when there's like festivals and holidays mm-hmm. and people are on vacation and this and that. And it's like, you can't get anyone's attention. Yeah. Um, so, so like spring and fall were really where we kind of like, I started to really focus and then, um, trying to plan more every year. I'm like, ah, record store day is coming up. You know, I wanted to get like something out for record store day or yeah. Christmas is coming up, you know, and it's like, we want to do something for, for Christmas. We should have been pressing something in September, but sure. Um, yeah. Like, but right now it's right now it's been really weird. We've been like, postponing and pushing back dates like all summer pretty much just because you know something huge culturally would happen and it's like now is not the time to really be like promoting Good point. ourselves or yeah. promoting music. Oh, yeah um, yeah for sure and then with coming up like we have what i believe is, is going to be our last release of this year on october 23rd um this artist zilch we're putting out her album doom pop on the 23rd and we were like, you know, talking about press and we were like November, November 6th would be a great day, but that's like four days after the election and <laughs> yeah. not knowing, not knowing where things are going to go. Yeah, I mean, it could I don't be a know joyful when this day is coming or... out, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, we could really be, we could really be fighting uphill if we try to put out something like four days after this election, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. three days. So, totally. Um, do you remember but, um, yeah. two thousand uh, September eleventh two thousand one September eleventh was a Tuesday, which was new release day back then, and I mean not like you could ever predict that, but I just I think of all the records yeah. that were released oh, yeah, on I that mean, day. Well, I know uh, I know Jay Z's Blueprint was going to come out that day. I don't know if it actually came out or if they postponed it. Oh, I was, okay. I remember like reading that. I think I'm not sure if it came out or if they postponed it, but like you know. That's I mean that's an album I mean that's like one of the biggest artists in the world so we probably sure. have too much trouble pushing that's true but yeah it's well like even, yeah but even the only the only album I know for sure was Pod I think Pod had a record out that day <laughs> and look what happened to them <laughs> right yeah, yeah exactly well, I, what did happen to Pod I don't know <laughs> I'll get a Google after this <laughs> well yeah I, I've been thinking like about the unfortunate situation of some artists that probably like were really catching some buzz and then this and then COVID hit and like yeah just something completely on on out of their control uh, and totally. they can't. Well, I think about art. I think about actors for some reason. I think about an actor who like worked really hard, got to Hollywood, landed a huge role, and then all production. I was thinking down. about that too. <laughs> Not like they need our sympathy, but I was thinking about that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is going to be my year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's like it's 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 crazy and um you know fortunately the we didn't have like a lot of shows or anything planned and we can kind of just focus on like a lot of artists i know have been focusing on making music no one i know has been hit super hard by the situation at least not that they've mentioned to me but it's it's just been such a crazy time for so many people and it's been this has not been a a good year to self-promote really that's right yeah exactly and and i feel I, I mean, I'm in the same the same boat where you know we have a release in October, but I, I don't. I haven't personally uh, on my own stuff, you know, and which I'm very thankful for. But I, I, it's been so weird because you know January, February was like just normal, but then, um, but then March, if you had something in early March, like when the lockdown happened, you were totally forgotten. It was just like the abyss, and then in April, it was like. Um, there, April, May, there became this like window where everyone was kind of stuck at home and wanted new things. But then, yeah. you know, and then you have like the 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 Black Lives Matter thing, and, and that was like a huge time for everyone to kind of step back and 
And then, of course, you know, you have the election now. It, it is so crazy because there have actually been li- little windows where people have been like, okay, give me something to listen to. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've personally ordered way more records than I, than I have in a long time. Right. And yeah. I, I, I know I was shipping out a lot of records for a while, but it kind of, yeah, like you said, it, it went in waves. And it's funny because I, like shipped out a bunch of like we had an order we, we had a new release and when we get new records you know i should i um ship a certain amount out to fat beats who distributes our records to stores and then i ship a certain amount out to the artist and then i like keep the rest for inventory and for shipping to customers online and then i shipped out a bunch of, to fat beats and then i went to the record store like down the street from me, uh, you know, a few weeks later, and I saw the re- one of the records there, and it was like just really funny because it was in my basement, you know, because I've been working from home in my basement, packing up records, ships it all the way out to California, <laughs> and then the store down the street orders it no and ships way. it back. To- <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was I thought that was pretty funny, but That's usually awesome. I would just take it there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt, this is so great to talk to you. Uh, um, it, it's been so interesting to hear about your process and and your label and your city. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was, it was a great opportunity. I appreciate it. Check out this great label at youngheavysouls.com or on Bandcamp at youngheavysouls.bandcamp.com. Also, head to our website where I'm continually working to get more resources for record labels, um, for things to help you out and to to help demystify the whole process. Go to otherrecordlabels.com where you can listen to back episodes and you can also grab all of our free resources from there. Thank you again for listening. Please subscribe.